So I decided since I mentioned seed certification on the last lecture um, that maybe I would talk about that briefly um, for those of you that might not be aware of what that means. Um, so uh, it's a pretty short one, but again, I think pretty helpful, especially if you are kind of using this as a like introduction to if you wanted to grow it yourself, make your own business, that sort of thing. So we're going to define seed certification. Um, it is used for a lot of agricultural crops out there, um, vegetables, some fruit, some ornamental plants, turf grass, that sort of thing. Um, it often does go along with plant patents as well, um, but we're really just gonna focus on seed certification, why it's important for hemp and cannabis, and then what it takes to get certified because it's a pretty long process. So seed certification, um, this is something that I talk about in a lot of my classes because again, it does typically go along with kind of pat patenting genetics of a plant. Um, so I talk about it in plant propagation, but the purpose of seed certification is to preserve genetic purity and varietal identity. So again, depending on how familiar you are um, with the plants, in this industry, you know, I talked a lot about cannabis sativa and the definitions for hemp and marijuana, right? So that's the genus and species cannabis sativa. And then oftentimes just through the breeding work we've done, we'll give, you know, the breeder will give the name, a cultivar name to that plant or a variety name. So for example, the CBD hemp plants that I grow here on campus are cannabis sativa. Um, there could be like variety indica, variety sativa, um, but then cultivar name, um, I grow Cinderella Story. Um, another cultivar is Queen Dream. Um, a new one I got this year that I haven't grown before cultivar hot blonde. Um, so, you know, it becomes tricky, especially with a new industry of cannabis, you know, coming out that people might just be tossing names on plants and then selling that. And if you cannot trace the genetic purity of that plant, if you cannot trace, you know, its um, parents, you know, it's, uh, I guess, family tree, if you would say that. Um, you know, it then becomes very, I guess, you run the chance of buying a lot of seed out there that might not be good. And honestly, that's happened to me. Um, in 2019, when we first started growing CBD hub, I purchased a cultivar called Cherry Wine. And um, it was a very common cultivar name. You could purchase the seed from like almost any state doing hemp stuff. So Colorado had it, um, places in New York had it. You could get it from down South, Kentucky. There might've been another one down South. And Cornell actually um, gathered genetic material from every grower saying that they were growing cherry wine and just through like DNA um, marking and tracing they showed that every single cherry wine cultivar was genetically different um, so whether that meant the amount of CBD it produced um, the amount of THC it produced the color of the plant you know the way that we see it um, the amount of flowers produced, like all of that was different. And so that's really not a good thing. You know, when you purchase a plant that has a certain cultivar name to it, um, and especially, 
you know, the person selling the seed might give it certain characteristics. It might say, they might say, you know, it meets the less than 0.3% THC. It's going to produce 10% CBD. Um, it's going to, maybe they even like go in even farther and describe the kind of like terpenes and flavanols that have the taste and the aroma from the plant. So if you bought those seeds, that's what you would expect to get then. But um, if you are buying seed that has not been certified, pretty much people can get away with selling you anything. Because we'll again kind of start off at the very top at the federal level, right? There is the Federal Seed Act that requires seeds to meet a certain germination rate, purity, and certification standards. But it also allows each state to make its own rules. So some states could decide um, that just, you know, like agricultural seeds are going to need to go through certification. Some states might think, you know, say like that anything people grow has to go through certification. It's really dependent upon the state's own laws. So, you know, at the basic part, germination rate, purity, all right, those are two things that are good to know, but again, don't necessarily tell you that you're buying a plant, you know, seeds that um, wouldn't have more THC or like, you know, wouldn't meet the actual genetic characteristics given to that cultivar name. So it's not quite enough, which is why most states make up um, this agency that's called the Association of Official Seed Certifying Agencies. I'll call it AOSCA from now on because that's a really, really long name. Um, and AOSCA helps manage each state's seed certification process. So there is a like building, an agency in every state that is part of the AOSCA. And um, so they kind of, you know, again, base it off of each state, what each state wants. And AOSCA, along with the Federal Seed Act, will make the framework to um, move the seeds through whatever kind of certification is required to make sure that they're genetically pure seed and then also to help produce the seed at a reasonable cost. Um, you know, as it stands right now, I couldn't find a whole lot of detail on this. Um, right now, it seems like there's only five states that require hemp seeds to go through the seed certification. Um, and AOSCA, again, is typically in charge of that. And those states are Colorado, Kentucky, Montana, North Dakota, and Rhode Island. Um, this could change, uh, you know, right now. I'm not aware of New York being a part of this, but that could change in the future. Um, because as you'll see, there is a lot of benefit making producers go through seed certification. So again, um, what agency or program runs it? That is AOSCA. Um, they set the national standards for seeds and clone certification. Um, and they are, again, working with hemp with a lot of states. And they also do typically work along with the Plant Variety Protection Act, um, which helps create patents on genetics and that sort of thing. Um, it is a, well, so like I said, each state pretty much has a building for the AOSCA agency to run through. Um, so that's the official AOSCA agency program enables seed companies to market genetically pure seed. Certification services are available for field crops, turf grasses, vegetables, fruits, vegetatively propagated species, woody plants, and forbs. Once a seed has been certified, it qualifies for the official blue certified seed tag and meets state, federal, and international seed law requirements. And that is just because AOSCA um, being involved with every state is also international. Um, and so it makes sure that, especially if you're like purchasing seed from Canada, maybe that that seed also not only 
meets the certifications of Canada, but it also meets the certifications of the US. So um, a few other countries that EASCA is also part of is South Africa, New Zealand, Chile, and another eight countries. So again, if you're purchasing seed that has gone through the certification process of EASCA, then you know any of these countries you're buying from it's going to be exactly what you're purchasing. There's not going to be any problems. Or if you do run into problems, EASCA is going to work with you to fix that and get you your money back. You know, it's just a protection of the buyer, really. Um, so typically they do work along with the Department of Agriculture for each state. Um, as I mentioned before, we call ours Ag and Markets here in New York, um, but other states have other names. Um, there's also state-run crop improvement companies or universities that, again, EASCA would either like be a part of or completely run. Um, but well, usually there's like both. So when they're like testing the plants, testing it for the genetic characteristics that you're seeing go along with that cultivar, you know, typically there's a run at a university and also a company that is like sponsored by EASCA. So again, different people growing out your plants to again prove you have genetically pure seed that's going to do exactly what you say it's doing. So the requirements for producing certified seed include special land requirements, planting eligible stock, field inspections, proper seed labeling, and meeting standards based on complete lab analysis. So typically seeds have to run through these four classes. There are some seeds that maybe only stay in certain classes, and I'll kind of talk about why. Um, but, you know, probably for most of us, if all we want to do is grow out the plant to then um, get the fiber, the grain, the flour, or the flour from it um, to sell, then we would want to be looking at the certified seed, the very last one. All right, but we'll start off with breeder seed. So breeder seed is directly controlled by the originating or sponsoring plant breeding organization. So there still can be maybe some small variability in genetics. Um, it could just be growing out parent plants to continually like cross, breed them with other things, that sort of thing. So typically we're not looking for breeding seed. Maybe only if you were a breeding organization, which you might like look for that. Foundation seed is typically the progeny of the breeder seed. Um, so again, a lot, for a lot of things, and I pretty much include hemp in this, they would have to run through e each of these classes to get to the certified seed. So you start with your breeder seed, could have a little bit of var or variability in it and genetics, and you cross it, those breeder seeds with itself, and you get the progeny from that that's called the foundation seed. And again, the foundation seed is going to be tested um, for germination rate, for purity of genetics, you know, you grow it out, you, some of it is like subjective rating, but you have to like know that it's, you know, less than that 0.3% THC, um, how much CBD it produces, if it's a CBD hemp, um, you know, there could be other characteristics that you apply specifically to that cultivar that it has to match. So, um, if it is shown to like meet a certain rate, um, they might put like 80% of it, you know, has to meet these characteristics, probably no more than that. You typically go up as you move down these classes. So registered seed, it's either the progeny of the breeder or found out foundation seed. Um, that's also sent to other places to be grown. So other EASCA um, buildings, companies across the US 
right? What happens if we take this cultivar that was developed here over to California? Is the change in environment, you know, moisture levels, humidity, is that going to change the characteristics of the plant that you're applying to this cultivar? And if it does, then obviously that's not a good thing. And you kind of either have to change the characteristics that you label with that cultivar, or you have to kind of go back to the beginning, to the breeder seed. But if the seed can kind of maintain that satisfactory genetic purity and varietal identity at these different areas across the US, then, you know, again, probably 80, 85% passing, then it, you get your registered seed. Um, at this point, you can purchase registered seed, but again, you probably wanna look for certified seed. And that's just because certified seed is what's going to be like continually produced as a progeny of the found breeder foundation or registered seed. But at that point, you know, like you're pretty dang close to 100% genetic purity and bridal identity, and you're getting exactly what you're asking for and what you're paying for. So all together, you know, it's supposed to be a coordinated, professional, and unbiased field inspection and laboratory testing. Um, it's an unbiased record system for use in meeting state, federal, and international seed law requirements. And seed buyers have the assurance that the designated seed has met purity standards related to a known description across seed lots and years of production. So it doesn't matter if those seeds were bred two years ago or whatever, you know, as long as the germinate or the, yeah, the germination rate is still good, it's going to have the characteristics you are looking for with that cultivar name. Sorry, it says all of that on this slide. <clears throat> like I said. Um, <clears throat> so just to give you some examples, because um, after the breeder seed, some of this seed could be available for purchase. So I've got examples here from Oklahoma State that you could purchase foundation seed or registered seed or certified seed. But typically I suggest to people to buy the certified seed. It's that official blue tag. You know, it meets the state, federal, and international seed law requirements. And you are going to have that really good, you know, genetic purity that if it says, you know, it's less than 0.3% THC, it's 10% CBD, you're going to have a pink flower with a pine scent to it, right? If that is what they listed and it got to the point of certified seed, that is what you are going to get. And again, if you don't, AASCA will fix that. Get your money back, probably can even like sue the producer, but So it's more than just like that basic requirement from the Federal Seed Act. You know, it obviously it still has the germination rate. If you can kind of read, I know it gets blurry, but germination rate 90%. Yeah, I'll write on this. Too orange. All right, germination rate 90%, um, total viable 90%, the test date. All right, if it's got any weed or inert matter in there, and sometimes it does, that could just be like old flower bud, hopefully no weed seed, and your variety name. If it's got the Plant Variety Protection Act on it, and a lot number origin, All right? Oh, just a lot more detail than what's required from our basic federal seed law. So hopefully you can kind of see that all of that is very helpful. Um, just to go through a few of these, the kind and variety might include the species or common name, cultivar, or variety name of the plant, and it distinguishes it from other seeds of the same kind. The lot number is important. It just tells you like when um, and where it was um, collected, especially if there was any problems. Um, 
right? A purity test separates pure seed, inert matter, and other crop seed and weed seed. And then it gives you the breakdown of that on the label. Germination percentage is because a germination test was done to determine the capability of a seed lot to produce normal seed seedlings under favorable controlled conditions. Probably not going to have any dormant seed, but that is there. If there's any hard seeds um, or seeds that don't germinate during the test, um, the germination test date should be current. And I mean, that's something that's put on all packages. Like even if you went to Walmart to buy a package of tomato seeds right now, the germination test date would be on there. Um, the seed testing should be updated every six to 12 months, depending on the species and state laws. So again, you have somebody, you know, part of the AASCA is updating these germination tests and purity tests. Uh, So, you know, is cert seed certification needed for hemp? My, again, my personal opinion would be yes. And hopefully at the end of this, you would agree with me. We already know that there are some states that have um, certification laws in place. And again, hopefully they're seeing um, an improvement on what's available on the market and you know, especially for the growers. So, Again, just to list out a few reasons why it's important. Um, I mean, pretty much what comes like directly from the AOSCA website is that it will ensure that the seed quality is high. You have a better chance at you know good, healthy seedlings. It protects the buyer um, to because again, it's meeting a specific standard level of high genetic purity, germplasm identity, high germinating ability and minimum amounts of other crop seed, weed seed, and inert matter. Um, but while I will say, I've got a link here to this um, article, I think a grad student wrote here about certifying hemp seed. And so just a few things of what he noted, um, you know, again, right after the 2014 Farm Bill, states were starting to create their own certified seed standards through their departments of agriculture. And their goal was to help farmers identify hemp seeds that would work well in their geographic areas and have less than 0.3% THC, like the law demanded. Um, but AASCA framework, you know, it didn't want to look at just characterizing the seed by that THC percentage and wanted to also make sure that it was genetically pure seed with a certain varietal identity. But not everybody was really good at like making sure they followed, you know, where their seed came from, how it was bred. So definitely it was a well-placed intent, but states tended to focus more on that THC percentage rather than the crop's progeny and it really started to mislead purchasers. So again, um, it was kind of, again, right at the beginning, trying to get this out quick, that a farmer could purchase a seed advertised as certified um, and believe it was certified based on its genetic purity when instead it was just certified on that it would have less than 0.3% THC and that it wasn't like all genetically the same. There was a lot of variability, even I saw that, um, which there wasn't really a whole lot of certified seed available to me in 2019 when we started with the CBD hemp. Um, and then again, we bought all the same cultivar, cherry wine, and it was so genetically different, um, even in the batch that I got different size plants, different color plants, different leaf shapes, different flower color, you know, different yield amounts, probably even different THC and CBD contents. I did not test every single plant, so I can't tell you that positively, but I would really believe it without that test being done. 
so, you know, it was, there were well placed intent, but it wasn't quite where we needed it to be at. So AOS had definitely kind of stepped back and really started asking growers, what is it that they needed to be a part of the certification? Um, and so instead of addressing like just the THC content, um, they also wanted to make sure anything with a cultivar like had these specific traits listed out with it. And that, you know, with the going through the breeding class, the registered class, foundation class, they could prove those genetics were then stable, pure, matching that identity. Um, but it's definitely still going to be problematic when there are states out there that don't, that haven't required the hemp seed certification yet, which New York is one of them. Um, Michigan, I think California actually doesn't require it either. Oregon, Virginia. So, you know, if you were to buy seed from any of those states, they would not be certified and you could have some very unstable genetics. So again, just kind of the impacts we're seeing from this, um, that's not going to support long-term economic and agronic, agronomic viability. An unregulated seed market stifles industry growth as seasoned farmers will not grow crops with unstable genetics. There's a lot of inherent risks associated with any new crop that can be minimized when it's gone through the EASCA seed certifying agency under the federal framework. Uh, so it's definitely helpful and it's kind of a problem that not every state is like, you know, forcing breeders to go through this. So um, buyers of hemp seed must be vigilant in their seed source selection. Um, Again, I do purchase a lot of seed from Colorado because they do have they do have seed certification. Um, and so this is actually paperwork from um, what I just purchased and it comes directly from the Colorado Department of Agriculture. It has their seed registration number, um, their license ID, the business that I bought it from. Uh, Yeah, and they sign off of, on it. And then I get all of this paperwork that tells me the testing, um, THC, CBD, all the cannabinoid content and any characteristics given to those cultivars. So again, it just kind of protects me. I know exactly what I'm purchasing. Um, that they've gone through those um, classes. So it stabilized the genetics and I'm getting what I'm paying for, which is nice. So like I said, Colorado is a good example of that. They've been certifying seed for a while now um, and they've got four part process. It does take time, does take money, but again, you get a final certified seed that protects the buyer. So this is a few years old, but it shows what some of the cultivars that the Colorado Department of Agriculture certified, because um, they were even growing hemp seeds that came from other countries. So the variety names there, and they've got a lot more than that at this point. Um, that was just a company in Colorado um, talking about their certified hemp seed. It says over the last, over the past five years, we have developed and successfully stabilized our own hemp strain, B11, in different fields across Colorado. B11 was one of only four U U.S. hemp seeds approved by the Colorado Department of Agriculture and the Colorado Seed Growers Association as a certified and exclusive industrial hemp variety. Our hemp is organically grown, non-GMO, vegan, cruelty-free. We use no pesticides and adhere to the strictest quality standards. 
but okay, I have a lot of that extra stuff. I just need to know that it's certified. So Colorado, because again, states can make their own laws. It pretty much follows that basic framework given by AOSCA. They have a little bit of different seed. Um, they start with research and development, which is kind of like that breeder seed, but they call that later on. They pre-breeder seed and then breeder seed, and then go through the rest of that set by AOSCA foundation, registered and certified. Again, um, there's another, a number of other reasons why it's definitely helpful for hemp um, because it could be relating to that THC percentage. So you're kind of guaranteeing that you're not going to have to destroy your crop because the THC is too high. Um, you have the stable genetics, you know, it's the variety, it's the cultivar that they said it was, weed and disease free. Um, if you don't buy certified seed, that's pretty much what we call open source. It means you don't know where it came from or how it was pollinated, who the parents are, all of that. You're going to have a lot of genetic variability. Um, and you're probably, you know, there's a chance you're going to have to destroy your crop because it goes over that maximum level of THC. So again, there is kind of a federal seed act that really only requires um, the germination rate. Uh, that's definitely a big one for all states. Um, the variety name, yeah, truth in labeling really just means that uh, you have to have the name of the labeler or vendor of the seed, the germination percentage and date of test. That's like really all you need. There are some like finer details you could put on there, um, kind of like the certified seed where you have the lot number. Oh wait, yeah, that's the other thing that's required for everything but percentage of weed seeds, percentage of inert matter, percentage of other crop seeds. Um, some states require that, but for New York, it's really just like name, lot number, germination rate. Um, so that's really not a lot of information and it makes it very easy for people to sell seeds that they don't know where it came from or they don't know how it was bred. Um, So that's kind of the downfall of it. Um, it does create this pretty big like buyer beware kind of community where you're suspicious of like everything you're purchasing and that's obviously gonna turn people away from wanting to grow it. And that's not what we should be doing. So this is just an example um, from California. Um, Which I don't know if they had on there that they didn't, they weren't forcing anything to go through certification. This might have been just testing, just testing different um, hemp seeds that they had. Pretty sure this was California. But anyways, um, some other things we could think about because it's a hemp plant and there are different characteristics given to it. Um, you know, it is a separate male and female plant. And I don't get into that too much because again, that's more of my production side of it. But if it's separate male and female plants, then and if we only want the female plants to produce the flower that makes the CBD, all right, um, then could we actually certify it down to saying, you know, it's only going to be female? Um, or 
give you an idea of what kind of percentage of male plants that, that will be there. And that's what you have to take a look for. So um, it looks like they were just taking a test of different classes of seed, like foundation, registered, and certified, and seeing the maximum number of male plants. Because again, if hemp is male or female, there could be some cases where you absolutely do not want the males. Um, that is for CBD, or if you're doing marijuana, you do not want the males because if they pollinate the females, that instantly drops the cannabinoid levels. So like CBD, THC starts to drop. So, um, with grain and fiber, it's okay to have the males. Well, grain, you need them because that's how you're going to get the seed. Fiber doesn't really impact fiber production whatsoever. Um, but I think this was kind of looking specifically at CBD hemp. And you really kind of want to set like a maximum number of impurities or say like male plants found in your lot of seeds. So, um, It is kind of interesting that the number increases as it moves from foundation to register to certified that they would allow more males to be present. Um, but again, that could be just what California is saying. Um, I would hope that like New York would make that number be smaller because the more males you have, the more work it is on the grower to constantly check your plants, find any males, get rid of them. I you know, again, especially for CBD. Um, some of the impurities, you know, again, could be like weed seed. There are a lot of seeds that are difficult to separate from hemp seed. Things like there's a hemp nettle plant that is um, often a like off type or the weed seed that could be found. But, so that finishes um, seed certification. Again, like I said, hopefully you see the benefit of it at this point. Um, there is still a lot of work to be done, I think, to really kind of define what it is that we need to be certified, um, but it can only be really a good thing to protect the buyer um, purchaser. So that should end um, this week. So be sure to just check Moodle um, in the checklist to make sure you get, you're getting everything done for the week. And I'll be getting the lectures up for week two. So I will see you, talk to you later.